All right, so finally we get to begin. So uh, on behalf of the International Rice Research Institute, we would like to again welcome our guests from the press. Thank you so much for coming today for the International Rice Congress press conference. And I hope that you thoroughly enjoyed the tour of the HQ facilities and our projects this morning. Uh, I heard that some of you already asked for um, a bit more time to shoot some of the some of the sites. So I, I take that as a positive. And I believe Rue is more than willing to facilitate any follow-ups in case you want to pursue more stories about um, IRC and ERI in general. So once again, thank you so much for all of that. And I hope that our scientists were able to give you a peek into um, the latest in terms of rice research and innovations uh, as far as Erie's work in, in, in the Philippines and uh, around the world is concerned. My name is Casey Santos. I am from the communications and advocacy team of Erie. And I would just like to do a quick round of introductions before we proceed, after which I will also give a very brief overview of IRC, just so you know the bare bones of, of this very, very important milestone conference. Afterwards, we will proceed with our 15-minute round of Q&As. I will also be moderating that discussion, so um, looking forward to that segment. Uh, first, I would like to introduce our panel for this morning beginning with Dr. Yusek Mer uh, Mercedita Sombilia, Undersecretary for Policy, Planning, and Regulations of the Department of Agriculture. Good morning, ma'am. And she also serves as the alternate co-chair of our IRC 2023 High-Level Advisory Committee. Welcome again, ma'am. It's nice to see you. Uh, followed by Dr. Ajay Koli, who is our Deputy D Director General for Research Delivery and Innovations at ERI who also sits as the chair of the IRC Program and Science Committee, sir. And finally, we have Dr. Alice Laborte, our ERI Research Coordinator for the Philippines and the chair for the International Rice Research Conference, one of the three featured scientific conferences within the IRC. And she heads the Program and Science Committee. So again, good morning. Allow me to give a Welcome, of course, a warm welcome to our guests from the press, uh, from the New York Times. We also have um, correspondents from the Radio Free Asia, Agence France Press, CGTN, Benar News, and the Daily Manila Shinbun. If I missed anyone, my apologies. Uh, welcome. Now I'd like to, oh, I also would like to acknowledge the presence of our Chief of Staff, uh, Mr. A.J. Ponsin. So there you go. All right, so a very brief overview of the International Rice Congress. Um, uh, this year's theme is on accelerating tra transformation of rice-based food systems from gene to globe. Now, this isn't the first time that we're holding the IRC as, as Erie, and this is our flagship scientific conference. We've had this for five times in the past already in different major cities and countries. So we're excited to finally bring the IRC home in the Philippines where the Erie's had Erie is headquartered, and of course, we're most proud of the fact that we're co-organizing it with the Department of Agriculture. So it's really a, a, a major collaboration between these two institutions. We already have the partnerships on research outside of IRC anyway, but this is definitely a good marker of our continued and sustained collaborations for our Filipino farmers and, and the Philippine rice sector in general. It's going to happen on October 16th to 19th at the Philippine International Convention Center. So um, if you want to join us there, I'm sure we'll be able to facilitate the arrangements. We also have a trade show component for the IRC where we partnered with the German Agriculture Society, or DLG. So they're known across Southeast Asia and Europe for organizing successful trade shows uh, specific to, for agricultural companies. So we're proud to have them as our partner for the trade show component of the conference where we already have an exciting growing roster of exhibitors from international and local private sector. 
So again, this is the sixth edition. These are just some quick numbers from our uh, International Rice Congress editions in the past in Beijing, Delhi, Hanoi, Bangkok, and in 2018 in Singapore. So um, we hope to add more to these numbers in the 2023 edition and your help in, in, in spreading the word about IRC is going to be very, very vital for us in a, to achieve that. Our, our, our roster of uh, sponsors and exhibitors are growing pretty fast by the day, and we're still trying to close more uh, agreements with um, other meaningful private sector and, and um, international organizations to join this roster. So you can expect keynote presentations from the uh, CEOs and leaders of these organizations alongside our national uh, government uh, uh, speakers from the government sector. So obviously, uh, we're, we're expecting about 1,500 participants to attend this four-day engagement conference. Um, we hope you take part in this um, a big undertaking. So again, it's going to be a, a hodgepodge of all of the rice value chain actors participating in this four-day event. So it's primarily a science conference, yes, as it's always been, and we're very proud of that. But we're also trying to make it as inclusive as possible by it, uh, inviting a lot, all of the rice value chain actors that are also instrumental in the growth of uh, sustainable food systems. Gretchen? Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi, I'm Gretchen Malalad from CGTN, China Global Television Network. So my question is, um, with the onset of El Nino phenomenon, how can we ensure the rice supply in our country? I think that's best addressed by Yusek Sombilia. Actually, I, I just, uh, you know, I just uh, made a presentation of the um, EDG Economic Development Group of the, it's a group of uh, secretaries in the DA, and they were also asking about, you know, concern about this El Nino. The good thing is that the El Nino will not affect so much the rice, uh, the, the rice industry, you know, or the rice uh, production of the rice sector. It may, but not really as much as we were expecting before. Because Pagasa, in the recent, the recent weather update of Pagasa is that El Nino will come, will pick from October to December. So what the DA has done already is already advancing the planting calendar. So all you know, all uh, rice areas that have been already harvested, you know, uh, with the dry season cropping, they have already been distributed with the high yielding varieties and started already their planting. So they would be able to um, harvest most, if not all, of the you know of the areas uh, cultivated to rice by, you know, between October and November, you know, and that means to say that the yield, the, the impact of El Nino and the yield will not be, probably be that much. What is, what we are worried about is the dry season crop, because, you know, with, the, with El Nino peaking between October to December, that means to say the dry season crop will be, you know, affected. So the irrigation systems, the, especially the national irrigation systems, may not have that enough water to sustain the dry season crop. But we hope that, you know, if the rain comes towards February or March, then we can again, you know, uh, uh, require the farmers to delay their planting calendars in time when the, 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 the rain comes. So in terms of rice, I don't think, you know, we will have to worry that much for 2023, but we may, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens in the first quarter of 2024. If that drought continues, you know, during the first quarter, then we might, you know, totally lost the, the, the dry season crop. But if it comes, you know, um, early enough, then we could delay the planting. It's still going to be affected, but really not that much as, you know, we have, uh, we have been expecting, you know, when, when Pagasa first announced the, the you know, the uh, warning, the first warned, uh, you know, the country about this uh, upcoming El Nino event. And we have actually prepositioned, actually, in addition to that, we have actually prepositioned, you know, just as I said, we're already encouraging farmers to do early planting. We have already also prepositioned some drought planting materials, you know, uh, 
other than other, the other than rice that could be planted to the rice farms in case you know the El Nino happens you know October November December so you know that would secure you know the farmers with their rice income you know I with their, with 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 their income from not from rice but from other uh, uh, you know from other crops uh, plus of course we are already um, preparing for you know the subsidies that probably may be needed by farmers who are going to be most devastated by by this by this event but you know uh, we it's a good thing that but ASA now, you know, provides us as early as, you know, six months, a year from now about, you know, these events, uh, you know, uh, uh, happening. And so the DA, unlike before, DA now, you know, provides already, you know, the, those, uh, prepares already the, the, what they call the program and the budget that would, you know, respond to, you know, events like that. So I think we are ready for the El Nino. Okay. Thank you. Hi, po. I'm Camille Alemia, a reporter for the New York Times and Radio Free Asia. Um, my question is more about Southeast Asia. Um, baka po you can share with us, because rice is a staple food in Southeast Asia, and we've seen yung mga um, kinds of rice that are um, that can grow in flood-prone areas, and also those um, in like in drought situations. How common? Are these variants in the countries in Southeast Asia, and are they already being used by farmers, planted by farmers? Mm -hmm. I believe Ms. Alice Laborte could answer this. Dr. Ajay, if you want to add, of course. Uh, we do have some varieties already available and released. Uh, for example, the green super rice 8 and sig RC480, so that has a drought and salinity tolerance. So according to our scientists, it is already being used uh, in the Philippines, uh, particularly in the Visayas areas. Uh, and we do have other varieties, as you mentioned, like submarino one that can withstand uh, flood uh, uh, flood uh, prone areas for a certain period of time. In terms of uh, extent of these varieties that are being grown in, in different countries, we don't have uh, the statistics for now, but some of these varieties are already being grown, particularly in areas that are being uh, experiencing a lot of uh, flooding or drought uh, periods. And we do expect that in the coming years with climate change and with frequencies of uh, uh, typhoons and uh, drought that we may be needing more of these varieties. So at Erie, what we're doing is looking at where these varieties are needed the most. For example, in the Philippines, we have mapped out the flood-prone rice areas, and we're also looking at the future. For example, where else these varieties would be needed the most, taking into account different simulations on uh, um, rainfall and also temperature. Uh, I think, Alice, you've mentioned everything that uh, needed to be said. I just would like to quickly add that uh, in uh, South Asia, uh, India, Bangladesh, etc., Sri Lanka, th these varieties are really, really very common now. Um, in Southeast Asia, uh, apart from the Philippines, uh, Vietnam is, is using some of the varieties. But I think what, what I would like to just mention is something that we call seeds without borders. And what that does, because Philippines has recently signed on that agreement, and what that does is that as long as the eco-geographic uh, situation of uh, rice growing in different countries is the same, uh, you would not have to test the new seeds two to three years before calling it a variety. And under that agreement, we can import a number of very uh, stress-tolerant varieties, uh, drought, mm -hmm. flooding, salinity, and, and Southeast Asia can benefit and the Philippines can benefit from that. Just for the benefit of our audience, I'd like to ask, what are the benefits for the people themselves about, uh, when it comes to the availability of these kinds of rice? How will it benefit? the ordinary people? Uh, maybe I can just uh, start something and then uh, uh, Alice uh, or, uh, or Yusek Mercy can add to that. Um, Iri actually did an uh, analysis uh, in Bangladesh uh, about 
what is the benefit, as you ask, uh, and, and that came to around $92 per hectare uh, of, of uh, flood tolerant rice, the sub one rice. But I think what, what I find very interesting in that study is taking it to the next step and asking the question, what do the farmers do with those with that additional money? And there are obvious answers of you know repaying the loan, uh, re repairing your house, and everything. But for me uh, and for Riri, what is very interesting is to see part of the money going in child education, and and I think that's where we actually experience transformative change. So imagine in a household, uh, you know, in a typical household in India or Bangladesh where this. Uh, survey was done. Uh, if the parents are are not educated, but the child gets educated, you know, within within a few years, the entire uh, you know atmosphere of the household changes, and, and the atmosphere of the neighborhood changes. So that's what I call transformative changes. So uh, there are immense advantages to the common man. Simple, you know, if these varieties are available, then, you know, the farmers, you know, can do their planting in any stressed environment. So varieties are available for flooding, varieties are available when there is drought, and they could, you know, continue to harvest rice, you know, uh, under, you know, different conditions. And, you know, it, if rice is available, of course, you know, that will stabilize local production and local supply. And that would, you know, uh, sort of stabilize also the rice prices, which, like in the Philippines, you know, we are very much concerned about uh, fluctuation of rice prices because it really affects the, the uh, inflation rate. And, of course, especially the, you know, the, this staple food as the uh, primary food uh, uh, const you know, it conti constitute the, 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 the biggest in the in the uh, uh, food uh, uh, basket of uh, our uh, uh, low-income uh, household. So they will bo uh, most uh, benefit if we have, you know, enough supply of rice, you know, and not worried about, you know, when certain conditions, you know, come about and farmers are not able to, you know, plant rice or they can plant rice, but they will have low yielding, you know, uh, uh, produce of this rice without the, uh, the, the right variety that is going to be planted in that stressed environment. So I think, you know, uh, it's really very, uh, very beneficial to have already different kinds of varieties that suit different types of environment because that will, you know, um, preserve the income of farmers and, you know, enhance, you know, sustain the availability of rice in, un, un, under different conditions that the country may, you know, may happen to get into. So it's, it's for the consumers in, in general, not only for the, for the, for the uh, household, the, the, the income of the farmers getting all their ba basic needs, putting their uh, uh, children to, you know, to, uh, to school and all these things, but also the benefit of the consumers because they will be guaranteed with stable prices, sufficient availability of local supply, and of course, you know, uh, uh, more stable uh, uh, prices of uh, local rice in the markets. Dr. Alias? Just to add, no, uh, we know that in the Philippines, we get an average of 20 typhoons a year. And some of these are very destructive. Now, if we have varieties that can withstand uh, periods of flooding, then farmers can still get income and still get rice. No? As mentioned by USEC Mercy, that helps in availability of food and stabilization of prices. We've had actually an experiment here conducted when we were looking at sub-1 varieties or the submarino varieties. And we saw like in one area where you grow the normal variety of rice and then in an, an, another area where we grew submarino after that typhoon these the normal rice or the regular varieties uh, is gone it's completely wiped out, wiped out but you still see the submarino varieties standing up no it's not as high yielding for example as the hybrid rice varieties for example but in situations where there's flooding or in flood prone rice areas is the best bet that farmers can do to be able to still uh, get income from rice production. 
Ma'am, uh, are we? Can you talk about uh, specific rice varieties that are climate? I don't know, climate resistant. And what's the latest uh, research and development of Erie? Dr. Ajay. So, um, well, there are a number of aspects of climate resilience and and uh, trying to make it uh, climate friendly. So, so we have to work on both sides, make it climate friendly and, and make it climate resilient. Um, we are now very heavily involved in research and innovation in something called the direct seeded rice, which uses much less water, much less labor, and is very good for reducing the methane emission from the rice fields. So that is trying to make it climate friendly, so you have less greenhouse gas emissions. In terms of resilience, it goes back to the strengths of IRI uh, and our collaborations with our partners uh, all over the world and in the Philippines, of course, which is making it flood tolerant, drought tolerant, heat tolerant, salinity tolerant. So this is something we have been doing for many, many years. And, and while we have been doing that, it now feeds into a bigger uh, umbrella of climate resilience, basically. So, so as uh, has been mentioned, we have the sub one, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, flood tolerant. We have drought tolerant. We now also have a very good handle on heat tolerance. So one of the things that was mentioned in connection with uh, El Nino is by changing the planting date, what you really want to do is make sure that the heat does not hit at a time when flowering occurs in the plants. And if you can take that away, then the harvest is, is quite okay. So we have been doing uh, a lot of work on that, uh, but I think we are now also concentrating on climate friendliness. So, so while, we, while we make things climate resilient, how can we get to a situation in future where, where these problems of, of climate vagaries don't happen as often? So that's, that's another aspect of it. Are these being used now by our farmers all over the Philippines? Uh, alternative wetting and drying is used. Uh, the DSR is being uh, used uh, very, very uh, little in the Philippines right now. We, are, we have a project in the Philippines to use that. Uh, but in places like Cambodia, for example, it is being used very heavily. Um, the other aspect is in certain areas it has been used traditionally, but in a very inefficient manner. So we now have processes and recommendations to make it far more efficient. So especially in Cambodia and Vietnam, for example, there's a lot going on for direct seeded rice. We call it DSR, direct seeded rice. Yeah? How come it's not being used yet here? I think it's just a matter of making it more uh, popular. So that, that, is our, that is our mission now, to make it more popular. Yeah. Really, there are some areas already that are, are using this. But as AJ said, uh, it has to be, you know, uh, the advocacy for this should probably be you know, strengthened. And I think DA is already doing that. Because we have a climate resilience office at DA. And all our program, banner programs, the RISE banner program is already trying to advocate the use of this, especially with you know, the extreme, the, the, the frequency of extreme weather events that are coming in the country. So. Um, just a follow-up question. Um, sa DA ba, do you see any apprehension or hesitation on the part of the farmers to adopt new uh, samples of rice or new variants? Uh, usually kasi, you know, sa mga, mga farmers, wait and see yun eh. Pag nakita nila na ano, especially when they are in, in certain areas, pag nakita nila na gano'n yun, gagayahin nila. There are a few varieties that are very, very popular to farmers and they continue using that, no? That's why there, is, there are always demos, demo farms that show, you know, how these different new varieties, you know, uh, you know would, would perform under certain conditions and under certain, you know, uh, 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 management uh, 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 techniques, no? And, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think it's really more of uh, them being convinced 
uh, may, may sometimes there are hesitancy, you know, of uh, of them adapting immediately, especially when they see that what they are doing, what they are using now is really, you know, you know, uh, doing well. So why do they have to change? But once that you know they they get to you, ex you know, to make use of another, and by word of mouth, you know, that I, I think it uh, that, that would you know, it's not it's not really. But there are certain varieties really that are really popular to to farmers. Uh, in RCEF, I'm not sure if those varieties that are being that are being uh, distributed by the Rice Competitiveness Enhancement Fund, Phil Rice. I don't know if those are the varieties that are really popular among farmers. That, that I have to check with uh, with Phil Rice. But there are certain varieties that are being used. But Alice can probably, you know, she's she's working very very well with with the. Phil Rice on this. Um, actually, uh, Phil Rice used the recommendations that came out of this DA funded project, One Rice PH, where they identified which varieties are preferred and also grows well in the different regions. So those information were provided to Phil Rice. And I understand also looking at uh, different conditions like pests and diseases in different locations, also coming out from ongoing uh, initiatives uh, between the Phil Rice and, and Erie, those were factored in in terms of the distribution of seeds uh, from RCEF. All right, I believe we're quite short on time, so we can accommodate one last question, and then uh, we proceed with our lunch affair. Do we have another yeah, question? Yeah, we should hear from the guys. <laughs> um, sige po, um, we were pretty interested dun sa nakita namin about the low glycemic rice. Where are we now in terms of um, giving it out to farmers? And at the same time, on the part of farmers, ano yung adoption level nila if we're already there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, I think where we are... Uh, uh, this is this is uh, something which we are really proud of. This is uh, something that came out of uh, uh, actually a, a BSc and MSc study from of a student from UPLB. Uh, we now are at a stage where we can say that low glycemic index rise in the elite background, and when we say elite background, what it means is high yielding background is available. Uh, but that is still available for, for testing in the fields, research uh, and farm fields. Uh, it still takes a while to make sure that any national uh, organization uh, like DA would have to adopt it, release it as a variety, and then it would go to the farmer. So it is still a little further away from the farmer, but it is ready to go to the farmer, it's ready to go to, into the system for releasing it as a variety. But that takes a little while. So, uh, okay. but what we have, uh, science-wise, what we have is that it is in the elite background, uh, and it can be transferred into any background, any Filipino background. As Alice said, we have a, a handle on which variety grows better in which province, and we can transfer it into all of those uh, varieties. Uh, we will, of course, need a project for that. Um, we also know that it works. It very clearly works. Uh, we have done human trials on that, uh, and we have been able to show that if you were to eat low glycemic index rice, your blood glucose will not rise as quickly as from the normal rice. So the science is done. I think what we are now waiting for is the process to take it to the farmer. Uh, Dr. Alice, do you want to add? Or? Just to mention that if you would like to know more about the developments in rice science, about glycemic rice, low glycemic rice and others, it would be good to go to IRC where we have a lot of uh, experts coming in from various countries. Actually, we have received already about 750 abstracts uh, for oral and uh, poster presentations coming from 46 countries. So this is a, a good avenue for rice professionals to get together, know more about uh, cutting edge rice science, and also uh, find out what's going on in different parts of the world. All right, maybe some final words of invitation also from Yusek Mercy and Dr. Yes, I think you should really, you know, um, attend that and spread the word about, you know, how 
uh, available are these varieties and how they are helping you know the you know countries that are you know have rice as staple food and even other countries Africa also is now you know uh, uh, very much into rice as they're you know shifting to rice as staple food and I think that will stay for 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 years to come I don't think rice will be substituted by other staple food especially in the Southeast Asian region so I hope that you can come you will be able to you know see a lot of you know of this new innovations research technologies that, you know that could really apply also to you know to to the Philippines and I think by knowing that you will be able to you know, uh, uh, help us, you know, uh, spread not only IRI, but also DA, the technologies of DA, help us to spread this to the farmers so that, you know, they would, uh, they would understand better. I think we need also that, you know, that, that, that kind of, that kind of uh, 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 help assistance, because not only from us, you know, to be, uh, you know, uh, imparting to the farmers the, the importance of these new technologies and for them to adapt so that, you know, uh, from, your, from the media, from your experience and from your seeing a lot of all of these things across the world, I think, you know, it, it, you could, you know, also convince them to do that. Thank you. Dr. Ajay? Just a final uh, invitation. I would, I would just like to add a, a small bit to that. Uh, of course, we would really encourage you to come and attend the IRC and, and uh, uh, get to know a lot more about the new tools and technologies, uh, which is a very widespread array of, of tools and technologies, right from you know, the genes and the genetics and, and what genotypes we have, uh, going all the way from agronomic processes, machinery, it's all, all there and its effects, uh, socioeconomic analysis of the whole thing. So that is one aspect. But I want to go back to what we talked about in terms of uh, low GI. Uh, the nutritional aspect of rice is becoming extremely important because what, what is very well known is that is the only uh, uh, commodity that can stay for a very long time. So one of the things is always asked is, you know, why can't people be eating more vegetables and fish? Of course, one eats as many vegetables and fish as one can afford, but most of the poor people are dependent largely on rice for the nutri nutritional element. What we are doing is really making rice far more nutritious than it is today, and not only in terms of the glycemic index, which is medically important, but in terms of high protein, high resistant starch, high minerals, zinc, iron, etc. And all of this will be on the show during the IRC, and I think uh, uh, it's not too far away. You should come and, and have a look and see uh, how rice can actually make a very big difference to the health and nutrition of the population. So I'll stop there. All right. Thank you so much to all our, all our, our resource persons for the press con. Uh, to cap off, you know, Erie and DA have the obviously are leading the research and innovations for rice and, and other crops, but there is a wealth of global knowledge possibly still untapped that we may be able to unearth at the IRC. So we really hope that you, 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 you take advantage of that wealth of information by attending. So again, thank you to our friends from the press uh, and also to Yusek Sumbilia for co coming here today and obviously our uh, scientists, Dr. Ajay Kali and Alice Laborte, we, we can now proceed to lunch at this point. I believe um, some of our speakers will be attending. So uh, please uh, share the simple uh, lunch that we prepared for you. That is all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Casey.